And we are live for the Fall Enterprise Event Halftime Show. And I've got Brian Summer fresh from the tarmac, scraping you off the pavement, man. How you doing? Yeah, I almost didn't make it. You know, the plane could pull up to the gate, but there was no one there with the airline who knew how to drive the jetway to the gate. You know, so they had to fly them in from somewhere like Omaha to come operate the jetway here. Uh, but I eventually made it here to the office, so it's good. Yeah. So, uh, so hey, folks. Uh, uh, if you, oh wow, Brian's got audio. How we doing, man? Uh, oh, we got the oh, we got the old replay echo. Hmm. I'm trying to think out. I think that might be on your side. Testing one, two, three. Hang on, folks. We're going to just do a couple of quick sound fixes here. Hey, Thomas, how you doing? Thomas is going to have a few things to say, I think, before this show's all said and done. Welcome. Testing one, two, three. Brian, how we doing? I think I'm okay. Let me see what was causing that horrible delayed feedback loop. Sounds all right now. All right, well, let's give it a yeah, whirl. Isn't it funny how everything's fine in the prep part, and then you go live? It yeah. does give you a little appreciation for these poor vendors and all this stuff we grill them on, right? And then we go live, and we sound ridiculous. Um, <laughs> little humble pie for John and Brian head up. But anyway, if you're involved in event management, vendor marketing, or AI marketing, you may want to have your stress pillow handy or uh, a punching bag. <laughs> or some espresso because um i don't know brian and i are gonna gonna go through some top five takeaways and it might get a little salty at times from uh from the uh peanut gallery here so just wanted a public service announcement i'm trying to to be on better behavior these days so anyway we'll see oh you happens. are okay well you, d you didn't wear a tie today, so that implies kind of fisticuffs. So we shall see if you can live up to that. Um, here's our agenda. Here's our agenda, folks. No special guest. It's it's the John and Brian show, and perhaps you in the chats feel free to uh, chime in. And uh, we're going to go through our top and underrated enterprise stories, and then we're going to hit the core of the show, which is our top five takeaways so far. So, shall we see what's next? Let's go to it, John. All right. Well, I heard, you uh, know, wrapped here, but um, I heard a new phrase at the HR Tech Show this week called a workday workaround. And um, I, I thought it was catchy enough that uh, it might start catching on in the market. So, I decided, well, let's get a jump on it and put it on our cringy buzzwords kind of list of today and, and then, then uh see you in decentraland huh yeah i never heard of decentraland before maybe i'm out of touch with all things in the metaverse but then to see all of that in one sentence that was like a um a defining moment in buzz speak so um i threw it in on the slide here for you hope that's okay yeah indeed uh it's i loved Let's keep the fantasy of decentralized technologies going. Meanwhile, the only person that cares about the metaverse has more money than everyone except Larry Ellison. Um, but anyhow, I'm coming in hot, Brian. All right. <laughs> All right. Well, let's go to it. So these are John's top, uh, top couple of stories for the month. Yeah, and... Loris, is, Loris is Sarah keeps, um, keeps, keeps hitting um, my top ones, uh, which is actually a bit of a commentary on the state of enterprise blogging. Um, I mean, because Brian, I'm not going to pick your stories, no offense, even though a lot of yours are really good, but that seems a little bit insular, so I, I try to reach out. Uh, and Laura keeps hitting it, and this one, we should not AI stupid. I think that pretty much sums up like a real core concept around wanting to make sure, in this case, Laura writes about supply chain, but that you, you really can't fix broken supply chain processes with, with AI. And it kind of ties into a concept that I have around AI as an accelerant, that whatever you sprinkle it on, uh, it accelerates. So that could mean uh, you make your crappy project worse 
in your bad process is worse, or if you're more optimized, uh, maybe it's better. Uh, so anyway, I thought it was an interesting uh, angle from Laura there. So I actually liked your choice, and, and I'll tell you why. I've been on, I've just been doing these um, around the world keynotes on kind of what you're not paying attention to on AI and HR. And I kept commenting and reminding people that the process that you created 40, 50 years ago for doing some part of AI, like talent acquisition, might have been relevant back then. But today, in light of all of the citizen AI tools that are out there and all the damage that those people are doing to your processes, you can't just put AI on top of an old process and expect it to be miraculously cured, saved, healed, whatever. Uh, we're not going to sprinkle some AI holy water on these things, and they're going to be, you know, top performing kind of processes anymore. And you've got to really blow this stuff and radically re-engineer them and rethink them. And so I, I, I like the article, and and I absolutely agree that um, we should not AI stupid because it's stupid to try and sprinkle this stuff on all the old stuff. Yeah, and and. Uh, by the way, folks, if you have article picks of your own, um, feel free to pop them in. This is your show, too. Uh, just just real quick on Laura's piece. Um, it, it might sound like that it's, that it's kind of silly to like say something like that so obvious, but she's actually referring to a, a major supply chain leader at a major company that said, our technology is tough to use. It will never be a good fit for our business. I'm just waiting for artificial intelligence to become mainstream and fix it. And that's when she said, laughing silently, even AI cannot fix stupid. Yeah. So, <clears throat> and, and then she goes on to say one more thing that I want to emphasize, and then we'll move on from this article. She says uh, that basically her presentation focused on the journey from cost mitigation to value creation. Her message is that AI cannot help if we are uncleared on the desired outcome. Most supply chain leaders focused on cost reduction and are unclear on value-based outcomes. So I, I kind of am a walk and chew gum type of person when it comes to enterprise. So I think that that business value conversation needs to proceed with and without AI. So that's sort of the point of that post in my view. Okay. What next, else you got? Next up, <clears throat> uh, oh wait, so we got um, Sidon Chu that this era AI ML reminds me of the dot com revolution, the bubble which blew and then became an evolution. I think there's a lot of strong parallels there, Sidon Chu, absolutely. And um, you may like some of my future comments in the show on that front. Uh, how Telegram, Telegram played itself, Casey Newton on platformer. I picked this one for a couple big reasons. One is I think there's a really unnecessary divide between enterprise tech stories and consumer tech stories, and I think it's often helpful to understand the big consumer tech stories if you're an enterprise person. This one has a lot of implications because it has to do with to what extent are platforms held accountable for things that go on on their platforms. Uh, so enterprise lawyers are advised to look at posts like this. And also, Telegram's a really interesting one because it's it's technically not... Uh, completely secure private um, platform as is Signal, which is completely encrypted. But it, it Telegram can be perceived as in, encrypted because it's been very dodgy in terms of cooperating with law enforcement. Since the story came out, Telegram has reconfigured its terms of service to indicate it is more cooperative with law enforcement. But Telegram has 1 billion users. That is enough users, I think, that enterprise folks should pay attention to what's going on with this. And Casey Newton had a good write-up of that. So in the interest of time, unless, Brian, you have a quick thing on that, let's move on to yours. Okay, let's go. Okay, here we go. And by so, the way, I really like that 125th anniversary edition. That is, that's a nice piece of work there. Yeah, that's a kudos to them for knocking that out. Um I liked the whole issue of this uh, of MIT Technology Review. And uh, so this is not a single story. And those are just some of the stories on the right-hand side of the slide that are in there. And uh, I'm not, uh, because I, I'm not going to tell you the AI in the future of sex kind of anecdotes out of there. You're definitely going to have to read those. And if I jump on down, 
uh, you know, it's what we leave behind. I thought this was a rather sobering thing. And I see it all the time in companies that uh, it says, as a society, we're creating so much new stuff that we must always delete more things than we did the year before. Now, I wish that were true because as someone who's had his credit information had breached whatever a zillion times by companies who had, frankly, either no business holding on to or reselling or brokering my data, um, there's a lot of the digital fingerprint that we're leaving all over the world and a lot of enterprise com- com- companies to the point of the article you just referenced, uh, John. They're not thinking or caring really about the people that get hurt because of some of the stuff that their policies do or support, what have you. And when I thought about this data that we leave behind, and uh, to me, it just seems like we're creating mountains of this stuff. And I don't hear any client of mine ever having a conversation talking about, but do we need to, just because we could store it and it's cheap to store, do we really need to do that? And what additional risk exposure does it give us? Anyway, I highly recommend the whole article. If you need a magazine to read on a long plane flight, plane flight tra- transcon, that's the magazine to get this month. Yeah, maybe yeah. S- maybe save AI in the future of sex for the home front, though. Um, well, anyway, uh, uh, I'm <laughs> sure John's going to read all up on the first article and probably want to talk about it in depth at next month's month in review. But um, anyway, I, actually, unnatural selection really catches my eye. But let's move on. Uh, to Brian's next top story. I like this guy's going getting rehired by Google at one of the rare alumni stories that I ever see in the HR space. And look at the price tag in that first sentence. They're willing to pay him $2.7 billion basically, to come back to Mother Google. And as a result, I'm going to raise my price if Accenture wants to get me back. It's going to be $6.7 billion for them. Wow. Any thoughts on that, John? <laughs> Uh, man, life is good in Carmel, Indiana, isn't it? Uh, well, man, you, 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 call, you call your own shots in this industry, Brian. Don't, don't let me tell you otherwise. That is amazing. Well, you know, like they say in Texas, wanting and getting could be two different things. And I might not get that full $6.7 billion, but it, it's, it's important to have a goal. Anyway, that's all I said. I got one word for Google, overpaid. <laughs> Next up. This is, there were a bunch of stories uh, this month of um, layoffs in the consulting and accounting world. And, um, oh, yeah. So, looks like, looks like the um, LinkedIn connection isn't so awesome today. Uh, so, if you're struggling a little bit on LinkedIn, sorry about that. Uh, we don't have the ability to troubleshoot that at this time, but it does broadcast on YouTube and also on. Twitter on my J O N E R P feed. So uh, I guess we call it X now. So anyway, there's a if you need the YouTube address, um, just just comment. I just right. flipped. I just flipped over to LinkedIn, and the image quality was terrible. Let's blame it on the hurricane. How about that? Um, Indeed. So I, I just wanted to alert folks that the. Uh, the petals are off the bloom here with some of the things going on in consulting, but there's a couple of untold stories that I think need to be fleshed out. Uh, when there are layoffs like this, again, mostly in the consulting side, uh, it's not just that somebody overhired. It's probably the fact that the what companies want and need from service providers is changing. And maybe some of these companies are too overly skilled in some things that are have lost demand of the market. I think we need to watch this a bit more carefully. Um, the other thing is there are some problems in just core accounting with layoffs. And that's a little troubling since we know that's a profession that is having a difficult time attracting anyone to go into the profession. And if they're doing layoffs, that tells me there may be some operational challenges with some of these companies. Anyway, that's it. Indeed. And I think one of my big questions is like, at what point is layoffs not going to be the fix that, that works, right? It's been kind of overused, I think, the last couple of years. Right. The yeah. half-time. And hey. now we, uh, I, don't, I wish I had like some of that, like, you know, NFL quality, like music or whatever. I got a bell. Um, 
let's charge into the halftime report, shall we? Uh, I mean, there's been a lot of events that took place. Um, I think the thing I would kind of start with, and I don't even know if I put this on my top five, but m- vendors kind of disappointed me as I was worried that they would uh, in, in two different capacities. One is that they oversold AI when they don't need to oversell AI because customers, for once, actually care about this technology and they want to understand. So you don't have to sell it, folks. You just have to explain it. <clears throat> Brian, I don't know if I told you this, but one of my favorite interactions that happened at um, Oracle Cloud World, because I went to the press conference and there were some really good answers from Steve Miranda on stuff like AI pricing and stuff like that. That, that are a big concern to customers. And I said, man, I wish all the customers had seen that because it, it was like much more in depth than the, <laughs> than the uh, keynote in terms of what really matters to customers right now. And the Oracle employee said to me, touche, well, that's what you're here for. That's your job. Ooh. Well, he's not wrong. That is, that is my job. But uh, I think it's also uh, instructive for vendors to think about like having more open conversations because you don't have to sell people who are already sold. You can kind of move on to the next. And my other big disappointment, and I think this is number one on my list, is that their over- vendors are overhyping AI agents to the point of absurdity. And so I think one of the reasons that's happening is because the Gen, a- Gen AI feature rollout just isn't quite there yet. Started to talk with customers that are using some of it, but it's really early days. And so I think vendors are feeling like, well, we need a an AI story. So agents are the next thing. But to be honest with you, the agent conversation, we could probably spend the whole hour talking about it. AI agents are complex, varied, have multiple uses, and by the way, are not new. Um, There's all kinds of AI agents that have been operational for years. So the notion that it's a new thing is is also a misconception. So anyway, that was kind of used as I was kind of afraid it would be to kind of obscure like uh, a look at a lot of the kick-ass stuff customers are already doing and using both in AI and beyond. So I thought that was one of the things that I was really cringy about, uh, you know, throughout the fall season and just really was unhappy about. And so I'm pretty grouchy about point number one. Um, point number two, and then on Brian, I'll surface for your comments. Point number two, on the other hand, was really interesting, which is one of the things vendors are focused on is getting the AI architecture right. And that's one reason why Gen AI has been a little slow to roll out is that there's a lot of things that have to be done around privacy and better output, complex um, uh, sort of architectures that involve both larger and smaller models for more efficiency, things like that. And those conversations are super interesting. And you know, I think vendors could share even more details on that with customers than they, than they have been. Um, but I think that's the more cool part of the story, even though it's a little bit of a tech geek story, is the architectural story. And so actually, I thought vendors did a pretty good job on that this fall so far. And so if I'm going to really knock them for point number one, I'm going to give a little bit of credit for point number two. Brian, any thoughts on my top two points so far? Uh, First one I'll make is... You know, there were like 500 vendors at the HR tech show this week. I mean, that's a monster uh, application software kind of uh, venue. And, uh, you know, everybody wanted to talk about AI. So to your point about the overhyping, particularly around agents, yes, that's true. One company's solution, though, was kind of the um, subject of analyst sniping in the background. Some of their just basic AI enabled chatbots could only handle four. That's it, four standard questions. That's all they could do. So to think that this stuff is that incredibly transformative or to pretend that it is from a marketing perspective is an absolute red herring. So for those of you who are thinking of buying some of this technology, caveat emptor folks, do your homework and be very diligent in checking this stuff out. Yeah, and I I think your your monster post that you did on Diginomica, like about the kinds of questions vendors should be asking about AI, still stands as one of the more important posts of the year. And it was pretty comprehensive at that time that you released it. Though obviously, there's probably some new ones we could add now. Oh yeah, but um, but but yeah, and and 
and and I I really think that that there there just needs to be this balance because there was so much emphasis on future feature rollouts and and I think vendors especially SaaS vendors have forgotten how much it delights customers to say you can go back and turn this feature on today and it'll start working for you and we so, need to get we need to get back to that a little more so one of the vendors that hit that I've been sparring with lately. Uh, one of the people came up to me at the show this week and all they were doing was hammering how many different, uh, you know, well, we have this many generative AI tools, this many agents that will be out this year. We have this many uh, machine learning enabled RPA powered kind of processes. And uh, well, that's great. And it shows a dedication of focus and everything else. And I'm not taking anything away from that. What I really want to hear from them is tell me about the business impact of these and tell me how any of them actually dramatically uh, rethought a process to make it much more relevant in today's world. Because right now what you see is what I describe as the way people season food in Indiana. They, they just sprinkle a little salt and pepper on the margins on the outside of an old process or whatever, and then they call it done. And, uh, you know, I'm looking for something that really um, took a whole new knowledge look at things, not just to be different, but because you have to consider all the new kinds of players, actions, other technologies out in the marketplace, how they impact your firm's processes. And then you want to design appropriate AI countermeasures to deal with that. And we're not doing that in the market for the most part right now. I'll talk about that in a moment. Anyway, keep going, Sean. You've still got Plenty of halftime goodies on your list. Yeah, yeah. So let's let's just run through those and and there's a lot more obviously to say about agents, but um but I'm just kind of hitting the high points right now. Uh so uh, one of the big ones here is customer data matters for better AI, but how much we're gonna find out soon. So I've been spending a fair amount of time on my AI pieces looking at how these architectures work and getting into some of the tales on customer data movement. One of the things I, I've been pressing vendors on is what, what happens to the data in the log files. And I got some really good answers from both Oracle and Workday on that. And I appreciate their willingness to, to get into that. And I'm, I want to encourage vendors to just be more proactive about sharing that information because I think customers really want to understand that. But, but basically, basically, that's like a really big uh, sort of gulf between sort of what you might consider consumer gen AI, which is like really easy to use out of the box, but fraught with all kinds of problems in terms of accuracy, hallucinations, like, you know, yeah, you can generate code with some of those consumer bots, but, you know, there's a really big difference between building a bad WordPress site and, and building like enterprise grade software in terms of coding. And so all this kind of stuff needs to go through an enterprise transition. And one of the big things is, you know, how can you use customer data in to get a better AI result? That's pretty clear. That, that these today's AI systems need to be fed customer specific and industry specific information. And a lot of that is happening through through a, a technology known as RAG, retrieval augmented generation, which essentially provides context to the things that you query from the system. And the appeal of RAG to a lot of vendors in, in the short version is that you don't have to put that data in the LLM. It's It's just part of the prompt. So it's not a permanent part of the model. But some vendors are also fine tuning uh, models for customers. I just listened to a really good webinar from Cohere about how they do that. So there's different ways to go here, but the gist of it is that customer data really matters uh, for enterprise AI. And what we're going to find out is just how much it matters, how good, for example, these support bots can be at handling queries. Um, you know, I had a little back and forth with with uh, Thomas uh, Weber Knight on that uh, because Thomas was talking about. Zendesk projection that a huge amount of queries, uh, I'm forgetting whether it's 60% or 80, it, it was a lot are going to, you know, the first level queries are going to be handled. I'll look up that stat in a sec um, and, and give you the right number by these bots. And I was kind of reflecting on how many successful support queries have I had with an AI bot. And it's definitely less than 5% of my bot interactions are successfully resolved. So the point is, it's going to take a long time, but but it, customer data is at the core of this, and so that's a really interesting theme. Um, and let's see what Clive has to say here. Yeah, it's it's the halftime reports. We're going to get to Brian's in a sec, so I want to finish mine real quick. Uh, oh God, Rag. Yeah, 
<laughs> but okay. but but Rag is Clive Rag is like very core to most enterprise AI architectures right now. So okay, Thomas is saying eighty percent. Yeah. So um, I I think I think that's a wildly optimistic figure. Uh, but at the same time, I have documented cases, but they're more in the twenty or thirty percent range so far uh, of of queries that can be completely handled by an AI solution effectively. But hey, I'm not going to knock twenty or thirty percent. That's an important uh, stat. So let me let me just press on. So the next uh, would be human team collaboration and process changes is the underrated story AI is obscuring. Um, and I think we still have a long way to go with the kind of collaboration that's necessary to drive these changes in organizations. And uh, I had a really interesting conversation with the CFO at a recent event that was all about that. And he's really interested in AI and he's working on it and they've automated some some accounts payable stuff and things like that. But the focus was really more on how he serves the business in a different capacity and how he can be a partner to the business and how that works. And to me, those are really inspiring and important conversations because if you if you can't collaborate on a different in a different way, then all of this is for naught. Um, and so I really was looking for those stories because we still have a long way to go inside of organizations with creating better processes that that, that can be enabled by these technologies. And so that to me is a really big story. And I heard some good stuff from customers on that. So I want to give enterprise vendors a little bit of credit for that. But they're not generally leading with that story as much as I think that they could. And they, I think we could really use some inspiring future of work visions instead of these mechanistic automation visions we're hearing so much about that seem to be so focused on productivity and operational efficiency. And to me, for employees, that feels more like, how long am I going to have my current job? What's my future? And I really loved hearing from customers who were grappling with that and trying to give a better message to employees around around how this future could bring out the best in what they do and give them important new responsibilities that, that would be meaningful to them rather than just a race to the to the bottom and headcount reductions and all of that stuff. Uh, finally, uh, I will say hybrid events are getting better, but still excluding people and not living up to their interactive potential. Vendors are still a little bit too obsessed with what's happening on the ground versus engaging virtual participants. They're getting a lot better with some of the session broadcasts, but there's a lot of a lot of bugginess still with like session replays and stuff. But they are getting better with like documenting sessions. But that's a very passive viewing experience, and there's a real opportunity to engage some of your VIP uh, folks that could not make the conference for whatever reason. And I I just think vendors need to be a lot more conscious that in this economic environment, there's a lot of people that want to get to your show that can't be there. So don't get caught into this fantasy that all your most important people are on the ground, because that's just not the case right now. And the technology is there to engage those VIPs in a different kind of way. I've written about this ad nauseum on Diginomica, so you can read all you want about it. And those are my top five. Brian, any comments before we move to yours? Okay. Let's pick up on number four for a moment on that collaboration. Um, it, you're right. That is a, that's a very important thing to look at because uh, one thing that vendors are seem to never want to show us is the where's the feedback button where if I'm a user and I find that some of this AI stuff is generating some junk or swear words or hallucinations, whatever, how do I report it? How do how does it how does anyone ever find out about it? And I've heard some really unsatisfactory answers from vendors on yep. one of them said. Well, we can kind of monitor the usage of a bot, and if it's generating junk, we'll see the usage goes down. And that's not a, a good way to do it. There, you know, I don't see the fields on screens, the places that can, you know, somebody could click on it and put something in or grab a screenshot and paste it in. Nothing. There's nothing. So for all the talk about the person in the middle, it's not there. And if that's not there, then I think the collaboration deal is just uh, not present either because no one's designing these things with an idea of connecting the AI to the human and having it work in a two-way kind of process to, so that there is a, a chance for both uh, the human and the AI tool to get better and better over time. Yeah, and it's actually a big misconception that these AI tools, quote-unquote, learn from these interactions. That's actually not the case. Uh, the, these models are 
are not retrained with that feedback in mind. That's not really how they work. But but Brian, when I've heard you, heard you answer these questions, I've been a little surprised by how vendors have been caught on their heels by that question because it's such an obvious and important one. They need yeah. better an- they need better answers to that because you want to hear from your humans on what's working and not working as these rollouts go through. So there's no reason why you can't create a, a feedback funnel for that. And I know you've been in the audience of some of those um, analyst sessions where I asked that question. And you're right. It, it's the stop them dead in the tracks, deer in the headlights look is what I get back. And you get a bunch of, uh, uh, well, uh, you know, kind of answers. And that's at the point when somebody like a Holger Mueller will type in on Twitter, like, and Brian chums the water. And, and I'm not trying to hurt anybody here. But it, because it's such an obvious thing, and it's been written up in like, uh, was it Kathy O'Neill's? Was that the author of the book um, uh, Weapons of Math and Destruction? That's several years old now. And she made a huge point in the book about there have to be feedback mechanisms for, to have any kind of good AI. And it's like, I guess nobody read, or read the book or they forgot that critical point. So that's something important in there. And maybe the second, the, it, you know, the game, the game report, the post game report, maybe we'll hear that some vendors have fixed some of this uh, moving forward. Well, you know, what I thought was interesting, Brian, is one of the answers that you got to that question, which I think is typical, is that we can derive a lot of that insight from, you know, simply how often people are using the tool. So basically adoption metrics, but I don't think that's nearly enough. And I think yeah. in, in general, we need to move beyond this notion that, that just how often a, a uh, someone uses a tool as a sign of whether they like it or not. I don't. I don't think that that's not nearly enough. I want to hit on Clive's points real quick, and then we'll move to yours. Uh, Clive says, uh, "Rag is enabled by a vector database." Clive, I, 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 I'd love to get further into some of the nuances of this, but I, I want to get to Brian's stories. Um, but I do want to mention that actually, Rag can also be enabled by knowledge graphs, and I actually am really int- intrigued by some of the contextual relationships that can be. Uh, fed into the system through knowledge graphs. Anyone who's interested in that, there's a ton of good stuff on YouTube on that front. So it does not have to be a vector database by definition. Uh, and yes, it is, <laughs> uh, as Clive points out, it is definitely uh, causing a sore in that. And RAG, um, by the way, is not well respected by people who pioneered uh, transformers and, and generative AR architectures. It's viewed more as a band aid, but enterprises present it as if it's this brilliant discovery. It's really more of a band-aid of sorts, but it is in many ways more effective than retraining your entire LLM, which raises all kinds of issues. So uh, pinecone skills are in high demand, says Clive. So any of you who are looking to polish up on your skills this weekend, uh, take a page from Clive's book. He knows this tech inside and out because he's a practitioner. Brian, I don't know if we should have like a like a, a segue of some kind. I'm going to see if I have like an audio thing. Um, how about like the uh, applause? All right. So, Brian, let's let's go through your halftime report. What do you got? So, I'm real frustrated because I'm not seeing any really radically reimagined AI powered all new kind of processes. They're just not there. Uh, vendors will tell you that. Well, first we're going to apply things in, you know with better chat bots, better employee self service capabilities, whatever. And then we'll get around to having, um, you know, uh, more uh, either agent kind of driven technology or, or, you know, but they've got multiple layers or flavors of AI capabilities and they're going to roll some out and then roll a few more out and so forth. But all their design is around what happens wholly within the four walls of the enterprise. And they're not looking at what uh, people on the outside of the enterprise are doing and how that's going to impact them. I've given these examples of dozens of times, you know, the issues about um, how bad actors are, are clobbering companies with stuff. But just in recent weeks, some of the things customers or whatever have shared with me are just appalling how people are using AI to generate massive volumes of fraudulent invoices that look just like the ones from legitimate companies um, down to incredible levels of detail so that they can, and in fact, some of them are multi-step frauds where they're 
they're basically finding ways to enroll their fake company as a vetted, you know, trusted vendor and, 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 and getting away with some of this stuff. So I'm not seeing vendors actually taking the lead role here and identifying what the radically reimagined ones or the all new ones that we need in businesses to take care of this stuff. It's uh, so that's a whole. This is. Can I ask you something? Can I ask you something about that? So, so I that makes a lot of sense, and I think like some of that is a response to changing threat landscapes, right? Um, and and you know changing adversarial circumstances, like you said. Is there anything when you talk about radically reimagine a pow- AI powered process? Is there anything that comes to mind that's a little more forward thinking? That's more about growth and revenue that you would like to see, or is it is is it more like defensive posturing? around sort of new threats well and there's a third category which is how do we just improve what we've really got Uh, yeah so for example i don't think we need modules uh, for career management or succession planning anymore to me that's simply an a uh, machine learning or algorithmic kind of uh, uh, utility that any employee anywhere anytime on demand should be able to go like Here I am. I'm John Reed. I've been here at Diginomica 55 years. What's my career path? What are the options I have? And what are, you know, and what kind of training do I need? That might might be a very short response. Um, (laughs) I doubt that. But anyway, I'll probably get like a, I'll probably get like a GIF of, of someone busking on the street corner. Um, Anyway, go on. Well, look, you're not going to get that $6.7 billion job off. No, I am not. I don't like my, I don't like my chances there. Yeah. So, so, uh, so I think there's actually another group, and that would be these like, wow, we don't even need a module. We can replace an entire module with an AI utility. That's it. You know, and, and that means, you know, you really ought to think about what do I need a, uh, you know, some of these tools for. And I think you and I might touch on something where you will need a tool, and we'll get to that when we talk about our good, uh, story coming up right after this there are the fraud related kind of things um in hr there's just tons of issues with uh what happens when two worlds collide when citizen ai runs into commercial ai and no one's thinking about what that overlap is going to be so when you got um when you have everyday people's resume spamming the daylights out of companies with tens of thousands of resumes, and you never designed your process to handle that, you got a problem. And we don't have, uh, right now, by the way, about 60% of the resumes coming into some big U.S. firms are from people who live in other countries. And even though the job description may say, we're not looking to hire non-U.S. authorized work people, we are not going to sponsor visas or anything else. And yet 60% of the transaction volume on resumes are coming from these folks. So why do we have a tool that skims that stuff right out and gets rid of them so they don't clog up the applicant tracking system? And there's, I can go on for an hour just on all these kind of problems that the vendors aren't thinking that way. They're thinking so freaking incrementally about how can we Tweak you know, like the benefits enrollment process with a little bit better self service tool. Brian Summer coins the phrase incremental AI. <laughs> Vendor <laughs> marketers recoil in horror at the concept. I love it. Uh, you're, you're definitely going to get me in trouble before I get through this. Oh, oh so. I'm trying, man. But you said you're uh, all buttoned up now, so it's going to be tough. Um, Thomas Webernight of CRM Combos over on YouTube. Glad the YouTube comments are working nice. Uh, there is only one way from the top of the hill, Brian. <laughs> Thomas, you might want to elaborate on that a little bit, but we will keep going in the meantime. Oh, wait. Uh, we, got, we got a question. Why do you consider applicants sending their CVs out with the help of AI spammers? I'd consider this self-defense. Ooh. All right. Uh, that's a fair point. If you're, you, if you, Thomas, are just sending out, let's say, handfuls of resume, let's say you're sending out about the same volume you used to when you were looking for a job. It's just now you're using AI to create better kinds of resumes or more relevant ones, whatever that apply out there. But what I'm referring to, there's like one guy who applied to 5,000 open jobs in one week. Then you can't convince me, Thomas, in any serious nature that this guy's actually going to consider doing interviews or screening interviews or anything else 
with anything short of maybe five or 10 of those companies, but yet he's going to spam out that much. So when I'm referring to resume spammers, I'm talking about the really egregious people. He, yeah, Thomas, Thomas is saying you'd use them to make better and send more. I, I could see the argument for sending a few more than you used to, but but I I, I would tend to tend to agree that f- that once you get into the thousands, that's probably you're not in the few more realm. No, I, I would I would say not. And uh, right. comp and in Thomas is saying because companies are automating the process means it has become a pure numbers game. I mean, like. I think that's sort of like the race to the bottom mentality that we have to be really careful about, um, both from companies and individual side. Because uh, I I don't think that that's I don't think just like blasting your stuff from here to Kingdom Come is the best way to confront an automated process world. I think a better way to do it is to try to come up with a way to subvert that scheme through through your own brilliance and relationships. But that's just me. Sorry, Thomas. So my second point was around rest in peace to business transformation uh, or digital transformation. That's all I heard about for from about 19, uh, excuse me, from about 2015 to uh, the end of last year. And now, like all the more recent shows, you never hear digital transformation or business transformation ever come up. All you hear is AI transformation. You know, some something happened one day, and I must have not been there when they flipped the switch, but it happened. And now the vernacular and the market has changed. And I'm not sure that's really correct because I think AI has transformative capabilities, but I think we still need to think about what are we going to do to fundamentally change the business. So the business transformation is extraordinarily complex because there are all kinds of change management, other issues that you will need to take care of in addition to what you're doing on the AI transformational front. Indeed. Thomas is still trying to pick a nit here. Um, Thomas, I'm going to, I'm going to give you the last word on this because I want to move on to other topics. Um, This is the other option. Just ignore the hiring process and do relationship work. Thomas, you know that I was not taking that position. I was taking a more nuanced position. So, but I'm going to give you the last word on that. Um, Anyway, um, Clive Bolton uh, says, I think it's the cloning replicating of GAI of entire systems that is going to catch the enterprise world out. Protesting compliance fails, et cetera, will be their only defense. I actually don't agree with you, Clive, around cloning the, the, the systems of record. I don't think that's going to be very impactful at all. Uh, I think it's going to be those who can kind of rethink processes and create entirely new uh, industry solutions around those processes that are going to be more effective than than just cloning legacy systems of record. So I, I disagree pretty strongly with that. But um, we're going to have to hash that out, Clive, on Diginomica in the comments section because I'm not going to be able to get into the nuances of that with you right now. Um, but but I understand your point. Um, certainly AI does make it possible to to clone and repli- replicate certain kinds of code, but that's, that's old, crappy code. Um, I, I wouldn't want that code. Anyway. So... Uh- out in the interest of time, I'll go real quick. Um, uh, where goes shirt services? Man, I've been doing a lot of uh, thinking on this. I've got a piece I was half written for the genomic on it that uh, the economics behind shared service centers were established many years ago, about three decades ago. And it was really all about driving uh, economies of scale, new efficiencies, and greater productivity and processing of, of transactions. The new AI tools and the robotic process automation capabilities really, I think, destroy the economics behind a lot of this. And I, what I've already written so far, there's a data center in Latin America that used to have around 600 employees who did nothing but process accounts payable transactions. That's it. They're down to 16 people now because all they need them to do is focus on exceptions rather than all the brute force kind of stuff. I think as we continue to roll out more and more AI, whether it's for self, self-service self uh, capabilities or to further tweak the productivity stuff, it begs the question, why are we locating these centers in low-cost labor markets? Because there's very little labor left to be done. And there's also been a lot more push-up for data sovereignty laws than a lot of, a lot of other countries. 
So I think we're going to see businesses probably have to change their delivery model on how they provide so many of these services inside or, you know, their firm. And the vendors, particularly the ones with big hyperscalers like uh, Oracle OCI, they may have a leg up here because their ability to flexibly move stuff around and keep everything not only in the cloud, but can also ha- handle the data software matters. Yeah, I think uh, for those who are interested in that topic, uh, HFS Research has been blogging a lot on the future of the the sort of like shared services and services offshore economy in the face of all of these changes. I don't agree with all of the analysis because it tends to be a little too much gener- generative AI Kool Aid for me. But uh, but there's some good stuff in there, and it's worth checking out. Brian, you you have a couple of vendors that have intrigued you, and and this is saying something because you've you've like gone through so many vendor briefings even in the last week that it would that it would make someone's head spin but you found a few that you liked yeah i'm to about 20 in the low 20s i guess in the last couple of days and uh two that really stood out to me and i'm not one to i'm not giving a plug here i'm just telling you who they are okay one was a company called first vantage and what they have done is They've pulled together something like 800 million records about uh, workers. Now, th- where they got the records, they're looking at things like data out of social media profiles or everything else. And here's what they're doing. I think one of the biggest problems in the recruiting world is not knowing who the authentic person is that's actually applying for a job. With people being able, like, uh, or our good friend Thomas here was even admitting that he would use AI tools to, if you will, perfect his resume. So let us know how that goes, Thomas. By the way, Keep yeah, us posted on that. Yeah, you know this is um. Anyway, so if Thomas has done this, the first advantage tool will compare what he's alleging to a potential employer against what he's already written about and talked about in social circles. So what happens is if Thomas, for example, we all know from reading stuff that he's like an accounts payable clerk, and all of a sudden he's applying for the CFO position at a Fortune 500 firm. It's going to flag that as I think this is a problem. So Thomas, for uh, you know, for all he wants to use AI to uh, perfect or enhance or whatever his resume, he could get caught. And this is one of the what I call a countermeasure that employers need. And this is a creative approach that this company is using by using other kinds of non-traditional data to figure out, are you the authentic person you're pretending to be? Then I saw another vendor that could spot who's hot, who's interviewing people who are using uh, others to do the interviews for them or take CPA exams for them or whatever. Because that kind of employment fraud is just rampant. Yeah. Anyway, so I saw those. I saw another company called Daxtra, which has um, got some really cool stuff back in the uh, skunk works. They're going to be knocking out the door. And I want to mention these two because they are solving all new problems with all new kind of processes and AI and technology stuff. They're not doing all this incremental, you know, not terribly exciting kind of stuff right now. So I like those. Yeah, yeah for sure. And I think we um, we need to keep in mind that that there's some really kick-ass stuff that goes on despite like some of the emphasis that we've had the last number of weeks on these huge vendor shows. There's a lot of smaller players doing cool stuff. Uh, and I, I, I was talking to a company called Zapata AI that does industrial AI, and they they do generative AI, but without any large language models, so they're able to avoid a lot of the sort of uh, downsides to the larger models. Um, Larger models have upsides too, of course, but very specific industry applications around scheduling and planning. It's not chat body stuff. It's totally different stuff. But anyway, like it's really cool when, when companies bear down on industry problems and Hopefully, we can spend a good amount of time this fall documenting that the rest of the way. Uh, and Thomas, um, you say your lips are zipper. Are you trying to quote Larry Ellison? Because um, zipper did come up as uh, in, in the context of security this fall. Uh, Thomas, you can write about whatever you want. I was just saying I wanted to move on from that particular argument. But you, you know you can keep going and say 
say what you need to say. Um, um, Clive says, internally, big European vendors call these offshore centers prolongation processes. Uh, 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 I like that, Clive. That, yeah. That's that's good. We might need to use that for uh, for our buzzword of the month next time. I was going to say that's that's maybe next month's buzzword. That that is a contender. Oh, and Clive, by the way, one of the reasons why I don't like the concept of pulling legacy ERP code um, and 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 trying to decipher it is because if I were doing ERP from scratch now, what I would do is try to build it from the ground up with tracking carbons, emissions, and materials tracing and everything else every step of the way. And, you know, that should have been done a long time ago. And if I were redoing ERP, that's what I would do. So I'd want to rethink the whole thing. But anyhow, that's a whole other topic. And whether or not that makes more sense to refactor code versus new code. Brian, you know, I think we're going to get to that topic in just a minute, but we haven't finished your top five yet. So let's get to And let's do, let's do that last one, t- 20 seconds. Uh, I go to Asia usually a couple of times, if not three times in a year. And it's always different to how different that market is. But I'll say this trip was noteworthy for me. I was in uh, Jakarta. These are folks who are not only hungry to know everything that's going on, like in Silicon Valley and beyond, but the way they're approaching AI is they know right now that their products have a built-in inherent cost advantage over products built in North America. And now they see some of the AI stuff as an opportunity to even drive that cost wedge not only further, but they're thinking about how they can use that to better penetrate markets in like the North American market where that's where I think 38% of the IT spend globally takes place. And anyway, we could we could do a whole show on just the Asia versus you know Europe versus you know North American market or whatever. But let's go to the next uh, deal, John. All right, cool. And I just want to issue a quick audience challenge, which is if you saw anything that you really like this fall, so give us your top pick. Uh, do that now because we're going to wrap in like 10 or so minutes. And for those of you that struggled a little bit with the LinkedIn feed today, sorry about that. I will, I will issue the appropriate feedback on that front, but we do have multiple streams, so you can catch the replay as well on my YouTube channel or on Twitter. Brian, here we go. Let's look at what's next. It is one more halftime story, and and uh, we're not going to be able to do full justice this one because I think it would take a whole hour. Uh, and in fact, Brian and I both wrote about this story from different angles on Diginomica, so there's a lot of coverage here. But Brian, summarize, please. I thought it was interesting. Um, I might have got more feedback on my version of the uh, story than you did on yours, John, but not not that we're keeping count <laughs> score. But uh, uh, well, a lot of that feedback, a lot, a lot of, of that feedback came from me. So that's if you'd given me feedback on mine, then we'd be competitive. <laughs> anyway, no, it was. Because the, the gist of the story, folks, is that they want to replace uh, work day in Salesforce is what made all the headlines. And uh, there's a lot of nuances to this story. And I would agree with John. You guys have to go look at the uh, different articles that we put together on this to kind of get the fuller picture of why that may not be such a great idea. And we might just leave it at that. Is that okay, John? Yeah, yeah, it's 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 good. I think I think the it's it's an interesting story because it raises three important themes. One is what exactly Klarna is up to because there's some conflicting information in terms of how much they're really not going to use packaged applications going forward. There's some data that's been surfaced that they are going to use some. So so one of them is very spef- specific to this company. I think the more interesting takeaway stories are like what are the potentials and limits of of AI and software development? Where can you and and Clive is a big fan of this topic, so Clive, feel free to chime in. Where can you differentiate? Where where is it kind of like overreaching that the AI is not capable? And where can it really help you? And where would you be just doing redundancies with with perfectly good systems of record? A classic example is payroll <laughs> that you brought up a lot in your piece. You know, so why would you want to redo something like that? And and so, so, so one of that is philosophical. And then I think the other interesting thing is there's always been companies that rebuilt their whole, that built their whole like stack from scratch or a lot of the components. And that's an old technology story. And I think companies can still 
do that if they really have the depth of resources and technical talent. So it, it's not a one size fits all because those companies, and, and some of them are among some of the bigger providers like Netflix or whatever, um, you know, they, they built a lot of their own stuff. That's not always a, uh, something that the typical, you know, enterprise can duplicate. So you got to be a little careful about extrapolating from market leading technology firms in that capacity. Whether Klarna is actually one of those remains to be seen, but it, I will find it interesting to track their story. And it provoked, I think, something we could spend the rest of the show and then the next show talking about if we wanted to. So it's a really good topic. It is. Okay. So what do we got next, John? I think we're ready for... We are on the do. home stretch, man. We are... Oh, uh, we're into getting ready to hit the whips here. So I got this email the other day, and I thought it was interesting, you know, the the nice CX personal touch. You know, Brian, every month, you know, our marketplace gets 1,500 to 2,000 client job posting, blah, 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 seeking help from attorneys like you. Well, I'm not an attorney, folks, and maybe I can play one on TV, but... Uh, it makes me wonder where these people get the kind of screwed up data that they use for email campaigns. And that bothers me because it makes me think someone's going to use that same kind of data for training an LLM and God help society if that kind of stuff is being used out there for those kind of tools. And That's you. good. Um, <laughs> let's see. Oh yeah. This one's for me. Right. So. Yeah, you know, I get all these like almost daily I'll get like a data breach notification. This one from Dell was really cheesy. Uh what data was accessed? At this time our investigate cuz I bought I bought a couple of computers from Dell, you know, years ago. At this time our investigation indicates certain types of customer information was accessed including name, physical address, Dell hardware blah blah blah. And then I love this next sentence. This information involved does not include financial or payment information, email address, telephone number, or any highly sensitive customer information. Let me ask you something, Brian. Do you consider your address a sensitive piece of information? Because I do. Like, it, it, you know, you can be doxxed at your physical location, and, and that's just one of those things where what a lot of these more effective, you know, um, scammers do is they pull information from different places. So they have, mm -hmm. they have your social from one place, they get your address from another, they put together the profile. So I don't think companies like Dell are in the position to say what's sensitive and what's not. Just tell us what was breached and leave it at that. Let me decide what's sensitive or not. It's just so ridiculous. It's like, oh, well, this breach didn't count. It's like, you know what? Sorry, Dell, the breach counts. It counts. You screwed up. You fucked up. This was a bad breach. I'm sorry. Just because it didn't have credit card information doesn't let you off the hook. So stop it with deciding which information is sensitive and which is not. I brought a um, consumer security person up on stage for a show I was doing. And they all he talked about was what you just described, triangulation. And he showed how he could triangulate all kinds of things in just moments. And the scariest stuff was he actually used a, a uh, he didn't say who it was, but he pulled up the uh, phone records of someone in the audience. And he was able to then use the telemetric data to find out where this person had driven every day. So he then figured out not only the person's home, but where his office was, and then he even figured out where his mother-in-law lived because he looked on the telemetric data for the Easter weekend, figuring. Uh, they would take that car and drive to one of the relatives' uh, homes. And he did this in a matter of minutes. It just shocked the daylights out of the audience. But if this guy can figure it out, then you're right. Some near-do-well is doing the same kind of thing. So you're right on the money, John. This is important to keep protected. All right, Indeed. what else? Indeed. Indeed. Oh, this is our... Oh, yeah, the Brits. They're something that creates value here, and I couldn't believe the British are spending so much on... You know, this is the kind of junk that flows into John and I's inboxes all the time with somebody thinks this is an important thing that we need to cover, but the fact they're spending... Did you, did you accept the embargo, Brian? Are you going to write about this one? Uh, you know, I, I know you want me to say I've got a major expose working on it for... Oh. Uh, but uh, the, no, Damn. that wouldn't be true. Um, 
But uh, maybe if Dennis Sorry, Howell folks. back to Diginomica, he could <laughs> the story. <laughs> I don't think Dan's going to come out of retirement for this one. Uh, but, you know, more more than T, I really have to question that one a little bit. Um, really, well, really concerned about that. Well, I will say it's been a good month and uh, a very interesting month and one with a lot of air miles in it. And I actually had a lot of tea this month, uh, particularly when I've been overseas. So um, I can't find, I just can't find Dr. Pepper just anywhere, you know. Now, although a good vendor yesterday at the uh, HR Tech Show actually brought one in for me for a briefing. And, you know, that means she automatically her firm got a, a one star bump up in their uh, review from yours truly i'm just kidding folks i can't be bought for a doctor cover for sure but it doesn't hurt anyway we got anything else today uh unless uh, we got anything from the audience around something that uh that you picked up that inspired you you have a minute or two to to chime that in and thanks i was asking for salty comments today. I think I got some. So thank you for those of you that got in there. There's some good observations there. Appreciate you keeping us on track. And I, I definitely want to issue a thanks to all those vendors that they got me out and, and got me engaged because uh, events are hard. And I realize that. And it's probably also hard to come back and listen to people deconstruct your stuff. And, and you did a lot of things right. And, you know, events, I, I would not know where to start with an event of that magnitude of some of the ones I went to the last number of weeks. So kudos for making that happen. And, and, you know, there's a lot of good moments that happen at these events that, that remind you of the, you know, the hardest thing to do when you're not at events, which is create, you know, so-called moments of serendipity. And I've kind of written about this, but it's a lot harder to do those virtually because everything's got to be a little more pre-planned. One of the things that I tried to do with a show like this is to create a little more of that unpredictability. And, you know, Brian, you've been a really great collaborator on this. Like, so, you know, we have Thomas here who says he loved the show. Thank you, Thomas. You you helped to make it what it was. I love that unpredictability of not knowing what we're going to get in the comments and how people are going to interact. And But it is a lot harder to simulate that virtually. And so when you go to these shows and, you know, maybe the vendor put on a nice dinner or whatever, and you end up sitting with people you weren't expecting to sit with and, those are the moments to me that that make every, you know, all the travel stuff that we make fun of that makes it all worthwhile to have those moments because those are harder to find when I'm in, in my back cave. So, so John, on that point, uh, you, you are very aware of a story. Uh, of something happened to me this month. I spent three hours on a plane ride next to someone who, uh, an executive who's going to implement a massive um, reimagination effort and redesign finance, HR, supply chain, um, EPM, and a whole bunch of other kind of uh, process areas in this global firm. It's a massive deal. It was probably that conversation was better than any kind of show I could have been to, but it wouldn't have happened if both of us hadn't been at that show and then got right. to sit together on that plane. So to your point about the serendipitous kind of moments, that's the thing that really makes the the best events really shine are all those kind of, you know, people you bump into that maybe you never even knew. Um, I was really surprised somebody actually walked up to me this week. They'd seen me keynote in Jakarta the previous week, and there they were at the HR show in Las Vegas the next week. And another one involved a vendor. This lady comes running up to me in the uh, near the gaming area of the Mandalay Bay, and she just starts talking to me. And I'm like, "Well, excuse me, have we met before?" And she goes, "Oh, we know all about you." And I'm like, "Uh oh, mm, yeah." yeah. Uh, but it, she was one of the major vendors, and it's just she was someone I had not met. But apparently, I guess the things that you and I write and talk about all the time, John. People actually, I guess, do read them, so uh, that's nice, and um, I mean, apparently it provokes conversation in companies, and I guess that's what our job is really all about. Um, anyway, I love the, I really do love those serendipitous moments, and sometimes some of those are 
the most clarifying aspects of uh, having been at some of these events. And I also share your observation, John, about I feel for the folks when you try and really put put a big show together, there you have to make all kinds of decisions about what's in or out of scope on what you're going to cover. I get it. I've put shows on before, big ones too. And and you want to make it entertaining and you want to make it educational and you, you know, and 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 putting together that killer content for it is tough to do. So I appreciate it. And I know. I test the limits of some of those vendors sometimes because I know I've got clients who really want answers to these questions, and I'm glad we get the opportunity to hit those kind of things. Although, frankly, I'm looking forward to someday in the next month or so to not have to get on a plane for a little bit. Um, but anyway, I'll, that'll have to wait till Thanksgiving. Uh, Thomas says the top of the hill comment related to Brian telling the story of me looking at your next career step. <laughs> uh, yeah. Well, I don't know what to say, Thomas. Um, I'm going to take the forward handed part of that compliment and ignore the back. Uh, Clive, uh, we're just wrapping the comments before we head out. I don't think GIA will be used to mine. All the ERP code will be used to mine ERP processes. Um, I, I still, Clive, we're not going to be able to resolve this one. I don't think ever, but certainly not in today's show. But I just don't think that taking photocopies of old legacy processes is, is the way to go right now. I think I think rethinking those processes is the key. There's so many things that have changed, uh, you know, in MRP and manufacturing, including transitions to service-based delivery, consumption-based, customized products, all this stuff, uh, energy consumption, ESG considerations. I, let's rethink the whole thing. I, I, I'm sorry, I don't see the value there. I, I think there's this sort of misconception that the value in AI is around you know, mining a bunch of stuff or creating algorithms. It's it's really about like taking advantage of like like deep deep hordes of data and then applying that in a in a new way to serve a new process. And you know, I think I think I share Brian's view that we just didn't see enough imagination applied to that um, this fall. And so the reason I'm kind of pushing back a little bit is I just. The idea of just oh we 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 mimicked a bunch of old processes just doesn't excite me very much. I'll have to see what what you're describing in terms of what they end up doing with that. But I that's not where I would start personally. But then again, I'm not um an an AI startup founder, so we'll see. Uh, oh, and um, Thomas also wanted to say that your stuff is worthwhile reading, Brian. So. Some people actually do like to read about the enterprise on weekends and evenings. So if you do, then you've come to the right place. I think on that note, John, why don't we take this to a wrap? And if anyone was ever wondering, John and I really don't know what he, each of us are going to say on this show. I mean, I might put together a slide deck and I might know what his articles are going to be. But I don't have any idea what he's actually going to mouth off with. But uh, yeah, anyway. and yeah, I'm, my, my, I'm just as stunned as you are sometimes. My my mom had the same problem. Um, <laughs> Clive says he you agree, but transition made easy by mimicking old. Uh, yeah, to some extent, perhaps. But I would just say that's maybe one tenth of the of the journey. Um, well, I'll, I've I've stayed out of yours and Clive's fight here, but I will say this. If you don't think there's a big change going on, you've got to think back about what happened around about World War I, where you still had armies trying to go to battle on cavalry units as opposed to uh, mechanized uh, you know, um, armies that start showing up. And a single-shot rifle versus a machine gun was no kind of deal. So you've got an opportunity to use some new technology to get radically different kinds of outcomes and I think mimicking some of the past, you'll be on a slightly bigger horse. You're not going to be on a, you know, on a 800 horsepower kind of powered uh, tank or something like that. Yeah. And look, 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 if having that gives you a head start, I get it. But to me, that's just a very rudimentary beginning use case of, of, of generative AI. And it's not like what I would be looking for in terms of like imaginative break the mold kind of stuff. and. Frankly, we just need a lot more of that because I think it'll make our shows even that much more interesting, Brian, if we can spend more time talking about, oh my God, here's all the amazing things I saw at this last show versus like, 
you know, why did we spend like time talking so much time on the keynote stage talking about the 50 AI agents or the 100 AI agents that we're going to release in the next year? And oh, we have a name for our chatbot now. Uh, you know, I'm sorry, that doesn't move the needle. It just doesn't. Anyhow, uh, Bob Stutz, yeah, yeah. Well, you know, Bob and I have circled around each other for a long time, so maybe that'll happen at some point. Um, anyhow, uh, Brian, got an, you going to take us home, sign off, tell, tell the viewers goodbye? So you get, see y'all at maybe the one of the very next uh, monthly review talks, but uh, if I don't end up seeing you at uh, IFS or uh, I solved or any one of the a number of other kind of uh, venues that are, that are shows that we're going to cover in the next month. So anyway, thanks everybody. Bye all. See you next time. <laughs>